Hi there. Thank you so much for asking me to be here today. Um, I am uh, on the paediatric board of the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and that means that I have the privilege of attending several conferences, and it's a lot of fun. There's um, a huge amount happening in paediatric allergy at the moment specifically, and um, it will be quite a gallop through some of what I think are the key issues. And what I'd like to do is, rather than bombard you with a whole lot of statistics and graphs, um, to touch on the key subjects and then um, hopefully leave some time um, for questioning. So just in light of recent events, I thought <laughs> Lynn would be interested to find she's got a new recruit to promote the anaphylaxis campaign, and I'm wearing my orange today as well, and we'll leave it at that. In terms of the hot topics that I thought um, were were strong themes, not just from this year, but preceding. But this year, there's just been an explosion of building on a lot of work related to prevention. And that is the absolute um, key to any disease. And I love being a pediatric allergist because that means that we have access to cohorts of patients and that we have the privilege of trying to stop the disease before it starts, to maintain health rather than cure disease. And um, optimal weaning for allergy prevention is absolute, has absolutely been a strong theme now for a few years. And I've used the term optimal weaning, which I've stolen from Professor Katie Allen from Australia, because a lot of the other data you see will talk about um, We'll talk about early weaning, but actually we're talking about what is the right time to wean to prevent, and we should move away from early, because that implies that it's the wrong time, and you're going in at the wrong time, if that makes sense. We'll talk briefly about um, what we're doing to try and cure um, food allergy, or promote tolerance, which is where we're at at the moment. I'll touch very briefly on anaphylaxis, um, food labeling and thresholds, digital technology and health, and how it can help us. and um, how actually you might be able to find um, information that you need on social media, because that's the way things are, are going. You don't need to attend all of these conferences yourself, and you can pick and choose um, the, the information and the stuff that you'd like to read. So um, I'll move on. Um, the uh, prevention studies. The, the key study, um, seminal study related to this was the LEAP study. And I haven't put on um, the details of what the LEAP study was about because most of you will have heard about it. And even if you don't know exactly um, what happened in the LEAP study, the key message of it is that um, children at high risk for peanut allergy were chosen for the study on the basis of early onset eczema and or egg allergy. And they were actually given peanut protein earlier than we would normally expect to give a baby peanut protein in our current world. And there's a lot of preamble um, before that, but it was shown that it, um, in Israel, there's a, a cohort of patients who were genetically similar to a cohort of patients used here to prove that there was a causal association between early exposure to peanut protein and very low peanut allergy risk uh, rates in um, Israel, whereas here in the UK, we had we're having high rates and increasing year on year, and our guidance at that time was not to give peanut. And when they found that there was a causal link, they made a, a lovely study, which um, it was rigorous and looked at, is it um, going to stop peanut allergy developing if we give peanut protein? And so that's the essence of it. Um, and then that was kind of slightly old news now. And then more recently, because we're talking about hot topics or even hotter topics, um, we're talking about the LEAP ON study, because what the LEAP study absolutely showed was that um, uh, 70 to 86% uh, relative reduction in risk for the development of peanut allergy in these high-risk patients. So a, a massive finding, and there's a lot that's been learned about the pathophysiology um, of uh, peanut allergy with potential corollaries for other allergies, but we need to test those other food allergens in turn because we can't assume the same applies to the others. And um, then once we showed that we were able to prevent peanut allergy in these high-risk patients for the most part, the next question is, 
Well, does that last? Is it a cure? What happens next? So the leap on study is uh, looking at a further year after the first five years of um, seeing these patients. They were um, given peanut protein early. They were then either having peanut regularly or not. And if they were in the avoidance arm, um, they got to five years, continued to avoid. The leap on study then looked at what about the ones that were eating and prevented peanut allergy? What if they stopped eating peanut? What if we just, just like people that aren't peanut allergic, we can decide when we want to eat peanut or not, what happens? And essentially what they found was that there is a sustained um, tolerance of peanut protein, and there's still a lot more work to be done. So I've spent a bit more time on this particular one just to show you the numbers, and do read the study, because there are actually lots of pieces which summarize what the LEAP study is about. And the reason I'm dwelling on this is not just because it's a team that I know and work with, although I wasn't directly involved, but because this was really the kind of haute couture study, and now we need to look at the sort of high street work, in other words, how do we make this work in real life? And does it apply to other food allergens? So this is the thing that started it all off and which is why it's important to get your head around it. And there are lots of summaries available um, from good sources um, if you're interested in reading more. So in other words, we found that there was um, a massive reduction in the relative risk. It also showed that eating peanuts was safe. These children weren't having severe reactions. They weren't having anaphylaxis and it was well tolerated. They actually wanted to eat peanuts. There's a little cheesy what's it type snack called bamba, but there are other forms. You, you, children don't have to eat whole peanuts, and we're not recommending you eat whole peanuts. We're looking at age-appropriate methods. So you have this little snack, melts in the mouth, well tolerated. So what do we do next? Community um, implementation, of course, of the last couple of years, we're trying to work out what do we do next, and it would take a huge amount of resources to make it worthwhile to prevent all peanut allergy, or as many as we could, by um, introducing peanuts um, early to everyone or to test everyone. So we're trying to work out what to do next. And um, essentially, I think some of that will be covered by uh, Michael Perkin, who'll be talking about the EAT study. So he's going to be talking about when um, we should wean, so I'll leave it there. So this is just to show um, that there are other studies looking at other foods, and there are um, quite a lot of studies looking at cooked egg. The EAT study covers a lot more than that but Michael will talk about that. Um, there are um, other studies from Germany and Australia looking at giving egg um, at uh, between three and eight months, slightly different times per different study, and did that make a difference? And essentially, there is potential to make a difference, but it does matter what type of egg protein you're giving, and there are practical constraints in that um, the child may not want to eat that uh, egg in a certain form, but may prefer another. How do you work out the practicalities of that? And that needs to be done, but extremely promising. And as I said, Michael, I'm sure we'll cover it more. So moving on to um, what we can do if you already have peanut allergy established, how do we treat that? So, um, sorry, that should have gone before the EAT study. So looking at, um, oh, we're missing a couple of slides. Oh, so oral immunotherapy is um, a massive subject. And what we're looking at here is giving a child who is known to be allergic, proven to be allergic, and then by, by food challenge, and then giving them a small amount of the food, the offending food. We're starting off with peanut, and in fact, we've got Andy Clark here, who's one of the, the leading lights with this work, where we're actually giving small amounts of peanut protein in the form of peanut flour, and then giving increasing amounts over time. So what the aim of that is, is to develop uh, a tolerance and it's working. It's really showing promising results. However, it's not ready for the high street. Um, I know that my slides have gone a bit peat tong, so I, I think there's something missing. I had a little bit more on oral immunotherapy, but the, the bottom line with that is extremely 
extremely promising, if your patients want to know. There are research studies happening that they can be part of. Andy Clark's team are doing work in Cambridge. Here at um, St. Thomas's, we're, we're doing a study as well, looking at oral immunotherapy. And what we're looking at is how we can reduce the amount of reactions, because there are. There are reactions. This work is being done across the world, and patients are definitely having more reactions. What about how we manage what we call the cofactors for allergic reactions? So we're learning more and more about the risk of an allergic reaction, what those things are. So if you've exercised, for example, so if you've got a little boy who's playing football that day, he might have a small amount of um, the study's peanut and be absolutely fine on a normal day, and then he goes and plays a game of footy and he's um, in trouble. We've had um, uh, families where, there's, um, where they're a bit unwell. If they've got a cold, um, that can um, lower their a reaction threshold. And uh, similarly for women at certain times of the month and various other factors. So these things need to be ironed out for safety. We need to look at the right dose. And there are many more questions um, which um, I'm sure you already have in your mind. How long do we treat for? What about if you want to get to eating like a normal person, ad hoc basis? What happens if you're sick or, you're, or you travel and then you don't eat it for a while? We know that patients who develop tolerance, if they don't eat the food for a while, they can react. So these practical things are very important and um, it's really not ready for home use. I've talked here about, I've mentioned here that there's a lot of other work looking at oral immunotherapy because not only are we looking at does it work, but we also need to know is it safe and are there any long-term complications as well as the long-term efficacy potential cure. So we are having reports of um, non-IgE mediated allergy called esoph um, uh, Eosinophilic esophagitis. In England, we spell it with an O, but the um, abbreviation tends to be EE or EOE. And what that is, is inflammation in um, your esophagus related to a, a chronic exposure to the offending allergen. And you don't get an immediate reaction, but the way that these children present, that they have sort of, they have discomfort when they swallow, they can feel their food going down, and they really present with swallowing difficulties or just not wanting to eat that food or um, rejecting a certain texture of a, of a food. So that needs referral to a tertiary allergist um, and and that's being reviewed. And there are reports of that being associated with oral immunotherapy. There's also work looking at anti-IgE, which is also known as omalizumab, but there are other types of biologicals being looked at as well, which is to protect you while you are having oral immunotherapy um, from having reactions, and that's very promising. But you probably know that omalizumab, which is being used for other indications already, is pretty expensive stuff. We know that it can work very well, but it's not really available for everyone to have cover. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done about that. Um, sublingual immunotherapy, um, I'll, I'll move on from this, but the, the, another important um, and hot topic was epicutaneous immunotherapy. So what that means is putting a bit of the protein, such as peanut protein, under um, a, a kind of a plaster which is then kept on the skin over long periods of time. I think they change it daily. There are different types of protocols. There's a product being looked at called Viaskin, and your patients may ask you about it because it's getting some press. And um, that looks very promising as well. We know that you can be sensitized through inflamed skin, and that's why allergic children are more at risk of food allergy, and that's been proven. But it seems as though if your skin is, is clear and intact, that actually they're not seeing sensitization, they're seeing the potential for tolerance and there's some very promising work going on at the moment. Looking at anaphylaxis, um, Paul Turner, who um, I know is due to speak here later but may not be speaking only on anaphylaxis, has given some fantastic talks. Um, he's well known for his work on thresholds and anaphylaxis and um, he published last year in Jackie um, an analysis of national anaphylaxis um, data in the UK and um, hospital admissions, which went up over a 20-year period by 615%. However, what was interesting, that there was no increase in fatalities. So there are lots of potential reasons for this. Um, earlier recognition or the fact that we say if you use your EpiPen at all, go to hospital. Um, and, however, it is still um, 
a huge increase and is worth looking at, but it needs to be put into perspective as well because we're not seeing more people die. And what we're trying to work out now is how can we actually find that balance of carrying your kit and knowing that you're safe and trying to live as normal a life as possible. And I use the corollary of asthma patients who um, go around with their asthma inhaler. I don't tell my asthma patients not to play out on a field. I tell them to carry their inhaler and we tell them to use their inhaled steroids. And I like to think that we'll get to a point where actually when you have your allergy action plan and you've been diagnosed, you can get to a point of more reassurance where you can actually feel, I'm carrying my stuff, I know what to do to avoid the allergen, and there needs to be some balance. Because you know, if you've seen a child with anaphylaxis, it's very easy to be worried that your child will have anaphylaxis you know, at every turn with the tiniest trace of things. And that leads on to some further work that's um, um, going on. So uh, uh, before that, I've put in uh, how many um, uh, auto injectors, adrenaline auto injectors um, we should carry, and there's been recent guidance from the BSACI, which has created a little bit of a storm on social media about carrying one. Um, adrenaline auto-injector and having one for school. So I know that Mandy East has already spoken to you about one in school. Um, and the BSACI's guidance, um, I, I can definitely understand why people are extremely worried about this. And there are lots of reasons why people want to carry two. A, you may botch it up because in that moment of panic, you just do the wrong thing. And what if you only had one? And also, um, we know that above a certain weight, the Resource Council recommends having above a certain dose of adrenaline, which is closer to 500 micrograms than it is to 300 for a patient above a certain weight. So uh, if you're an adult, certainly, and if you're an obese child, um, that could be a consideration. And there are different types of adrenaline auto-injectors, and we're tailoring our thoughts around that a little bit more. So if I see a bigger child, and we know that um, it's they probably don't need to carry two because they haven't previously had anaphylaxis, they don't have severe asthma, I would prefer that they carry a 500 microgram um, adrenaline pen than a 300. There's lots of work around this, but I think actually we need to really think about it and that it's too soon to panic because if you are carrying your um, auto-injector and you know how to use it, that actually for the most part we are showing that people are not dying from anaphylaxis. And we definitely need to find that balance because on the other hand, we don't want people to get lackadaisical. Um, so talking about food labeling and thresholds, um, Again, this leads into how much of the food really is a worry. And this is really amazing work that's being done um, at various different levels, but there's a massive organization um, devoted to looking at a food allergy and um, anaphylaxis. And the IFAM group, um, along with Ilse, please don't tell me, ask me to tell you what they stand for right this second. Um, they have been looking at, over a period of time, the Europrevail data, and I know that um, Lynn's previously mention this, but there's a huge cohort of patients across Europe that are being looked at for all different aspects of food allergy, and we're being able to, uh, we're, we're using this data to be able to look at the thresholds that cause reactions. It's extremely exciting work, and um, Claire Mills of Manchester leads this work, Paul Turner's integrally involved, and the Anaphylaxis campaign has been an incredible champion for this work. Um, food manufacturers and retailers are involved, and um, an excellent start has been made, and we're looking looking at um, the thresholds that would cause you to have a reaction um, for certain foods. So starting with hazelnut, egg, and milk, and Barbara um, Balma Weber in 2014 has um, produced some work showing the specific thresholds. And without showing a whole lot of boring data, because you, you're welcome to look this up if you're interested, but the bottom line for that is, is that actually, for the most part, people tend not to react at tiny amounts. They don't tend to react at traces. And I know that we've been fighting for recognition for um, allergy awareness for so long that we do want to tread carefully with our message. But what we're saying is uh, we're looking for the ED05 level. You can see that up there. And that stands for the eliciting dose for 5%. So if you had 100 people that, had, um, that have a food allergy, let's say we're talking about peanut allergy, then 95% of people won't react at that amount. 
there are there is some fine print around that. I don't have time to go into it today, but all of that's being looked at. The bottom line is that, on the whole, the thresholds are higher than we previously thought, and what we need to do is to know how much is in the foods and have a good understanding of that individual patient to have an idea of whether they're more likely to be in the 95% that won't react or the 5% that will. And they need to carry their kit, they need to take their kit. So. Um, what I found quite interesting was for prawns, for example, you really have to eat grams of prawns. You tend not to react if you've had something touch a prawn. Um, egg in babies, a small amount can cause a reaction in babies and infants. And then there's a lot of variation in between. And these are, some of them are published and there's more to come. The other work they're looking at is the analysis of allergens in the food chain, the process from farm to fork, how that's done, how rigorous it is. And I've been privileged to attend several of those meetings now, and I've really been struck at how rigorous the approach is from retailers, caterers. There really isn't the attitude of we'll just slap on a may contain just to cover ourselves, which is really what I used to think as a clinician, that, oh, they've got those may contains, they're just covering themselves. But really, when you look at the process and you see how manufacturing plants can, can change their process, um, it really is tricky for people to get it right. If we're looking at labeling, we can have something that's made in a factory um, in England, but the Irish one has... Uh, peanut exposure, they print one label for all the product because the product is otherwise the same, and that will then say may contain peanuts. But in fact, all of the ones produced in England are free of peanuts. So that kind of stuff to drill down um, to that kind of information is something that needs to be looked at. And then the, the development of food allergy knowledge base um, is really key. So what do people react to in the community? and um, how often do they react, and what kind of reactions are they having. Um, right now, if I see a patient in clinic, they'll tell me about something you know, that they remember, a big reaction, but they won't sort of spend that precious time in clinic going over all the tiny little reactions that they've had. They may not remember exactly which food, and we need to find a better way to find out how to do that. So I want to have time for questions, but there's a little more to come. How much time do I have left, Andy? Yep, so another five minutes. So one of the things um, that, that I'm really interested in is digital technology um, and health and innovation and nutrition for health. And I've put up um, this slide because um, my disclosure is that I've um, co-founded um, a, a system an intelligent food search with a tech company and with input from the guys in St. Thomas's dietetic team, not just allergy, but gastroenterology, and it's having more input all the time in order to help people choose foods with more information, with clinical backing, and using dietetic sort of um, terms to be able to find the synonyms for foods so that they really, if they're excluding milk, they're excluding whey protein. The 14 allergens now are pretty well catered for. They have to be in bold. But what about if you're one of my patients? and you're allergic to corn. I've had a patient have a positive challenge to broccoli or um, cumin, you know, something that's not legally required. And even if we're just talking about milk, we've all been faced with this scenario. When you get your diagnosis and you, you're kind of told to avoid milk, the dietitian will give you some information. You're bombarded with a whole lot of information. You leave the clinic, you go to the supermarket, and you can spend hours reading labels because this is what happens. Things that look very similar, one is safe and one isn't. And how do you do that? Well, people's quality of life are severely impacted upon, and I think everyone in the audience here knows that. So we're kind of making what I like to think of as the Google of food, and it's starting off looking at ingredients, but it will eventually be able to, and it is starting to, do things like if you want to be able to search supermarket foods and you want a ready-made food, you'd be able to search for egg-free lasagna or you'd be able to put in, at the moment, you can put in your profile and then call up the foods that you can eat. This is what it looks like, and it's available on Android, it's available on iPhone as well, and you will set your profile, and then you're able to do the search in a number of different ways. If you're looking for a cereal, um, or a cereal bar that doesn't contain certain nuts, because we're doing more selective nut eating as well, you can put that in there, 
and see what you can eat. There'll be a smiley face if you can. And there's a way for you to check the ingredients, the nutritional information. And increasingly, organically, we're putting on product notes about things. So if we know that there's a specific factory that doesn't work with the food and is essentially free from, we'll be able to say that. Even if the company themselves doesn't want to write free from. So one example is Ferrero Russia. Um, they have hazelnuts. We know that virtually from the farm where they've got hazelnut groves in Turkey, they do not work with other nuts. And so if you're peanut allergic, um, having Nutella is safe for you. Nutella gets made by Ferrero Russia. We can put that on the product note. And it's got the date. Um, if recipes change, it's, it's updated. Um, basically, you know, as real time as it can get, in that it's, um, yeah, it's updated regularly. There's six major supermarkets foods on there. I know that there's some leaflets around, so I won't spend more time on that. Um, and it's something that has instructions. Our patients um, get the information. And this is also really um, useful. It's a healthcare portal, which um, is mainly for dietitians, but can be used by the healthcare professionals. You need your GMC number or your uh, BDA number and nutritionist number as well. And you can search for foods, make lists for your patients, and send it by email or to their app directly. And all of that's a free service. These are the relationships and acknowledgements that we have at the moment. Um, I really want to thank Lynn and the anaphylaxis campaign because really from early on, they kind of said, this is a good thing. They see a, a lot of stuff come over their desk and they said to us, well, actually, this is the first that we've seen that's clinically backed and does what it says it's going to do and we're developing it all the time. We've got an amazing tech team. And we've uh, partnered with Guys and St. Thomas's Trust for the, the expertise of the team. Celiac UK has asked us to make their gluten-free checker and that's now available, and they've given the information for the gluten-free food, so you know that that's stuff that you can trust. And what this is here to tell you is that it's information that your patient can trust, that you and your patient can trust. Um, since this slide, we have Sainsbury's and Co-op as well, and it's being used across the UK at the moment. These are some um, comments that we've had. Um, I'll, I'll just read this one because I really liked um, this one from Rachel. This was um, a little boy who's had anaphylaxis to milk and egg, and actually he's allergic to cashew and pistachio as well. And um, when he goes to sports, he has two cereal bars that he knows are safe. And, you know, as you get a bit older, that gets a little bit boring, and uh, you don't want stuff in a Tupperware that your mum's made. So we did the search for him, and we were able to find with his restrictions 11 um, cereal bars that he was safe to eat. And they were virtually crying in the clinic. And that, you know, that's the kind of thing that makes you feel really good about things. Um, and then I've put on social media because this is how I've learned a hell of a lot <laughs> about allergy, what my patients are thinking, what they're thinking in the US, um, in 140 characters, and I was really skeptical about it because I just didn't want to spend all day um, on social media. I use my profile um, just as a professional profile, and uh, it's like an online journal club. And now there are some um, allergy families that follow me, but on the whole, it's uh, for dietitians. You know, that, that's who I choose to follow, and I'm finding out what happens at the Quad AI meetings, I'm finding out what happens across the world. If the patients are concerned about things, you can pick that up and you can address needs more easily. I'm not saying I use it as a consultation um, a service, it definitely is not, but it definitely gives you an idea of, of what's going on and what's current. This is to say um, that <laughs> we really enjoy the meetings. We all um, share our information, and uh, we're all working to the same goals. And there's a really great conference which will be here in London, which I highly recommend. It's uh, the Pediatric Allergy and Asthma Meeting. It will be here um, in London in October next year. I'm helping to organize it with George Detoy and a team of people will be involving everybody. And it'll be aimed at dietitians, nurses, or have sections to deal, you know, to address um, issues that are helpful to all um, clinicians involved um, in allergy care and not just tertiary allergists. So I hope I've got some time left for questions. Um, thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Laurie-Anne. So, questions, please. 
we have time for one question. So uh, can you put your finger on any big studies that might be published in the next 12 months that would be influential? Is there anything out there that you think that we should keep an eye out for particularly? Um, so there, there's more work on the epicutaneous um, uh, immunotherapy that will be worthwhile. Um, and would like to see more of your work as well, Andy. Is that coming out in the next 12 months? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, is the honest answer. <laughs> okay, I think we've caught up the time. Are there any questions? If not, we'll move on. Thank you very much, Laurie Ann. Well done. Sure.